Hello, everybody. I'm Anthony Gonzalez. I'm the program coordinator with the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery out of the College of Social Work on the Ohio State University campus. Thank you all for joining us today. We're very excited to have you for our, our webinar titled Tobacco and Vape Flavors, Kids and Race, featuring our presenters, uh, Dr. Rob Crane and Amanda Swenson-Turner. Before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping slides that we would like to review. As you notice, we are using the Zoom platform. We do welcome your questions and please feel free to submit them at any time throughout the live session. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do encourage you to use the Q&A as sometimes questions might get missed in the chat. We also encourage you to learn more about becoming a member of the Higher Education Center. You can do so by visiting our website at hecaod.osu.edu. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to, us, introduce to you today our presenters. Our presenter, Dr. Rob Crane and Amanda Swenson-Turner. Dr. Rob Crane is a clinical professor of family medicine at The Ohio State University and is the founder and president of the Prevention Tobacco Addiction Foundation. And Amanda Swenson-Turner is the Executive Director of the Prevention Tobacco Addiction Foundation. Thank you both for joining us today and it's my pleasure turning it over to you at this time. Great, thank you so much. So we are honored to be with all of you this afternoon and thankful for your participation in this really important topic. Today, our goals are to share with you a little bit about the organization, why and what we do. And I apologize, this might be a repeat for some of you that joined us back in July. So I will try to quickly go through and, and give you a high level of what we, what we do as an organization. Then Dr. Rob Crane will go through in detail about the dangers of nicotine specific to flavors. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about the history of menthol and its role in health inequities. And then we're also gonna go through the importance of enforcement and hopefully arm you with some ideas of what you can do back in your communities. Here we go, all right. Technology at its best. So we are the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation and we were established in 1996 with the mission to reduce the health and economic impact of tobacco use and nicotine addiction through education, advocacy and policy change. So what does that mean? Well, we work across the country to introduce sound legislation that works to help prevent kids from initiating the use of tobacco products. These are policies that aim to limit the tobacco industry's access to kids. And I should pause and say that when we say tobacco industry, that includes tobacco, all tobacco products, combustible cigarettes, cigars, electronic cigarettes, or as a lot of people call it, uh, vaping. And I think it's important to understand personally why we do what we do. Both Rob and I have had family members pass away from lung cancer due to their addiction to tobacco. So you can say we are both on a personal mission to do good from ter terrible circumstances. And I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir and most of you already know this, but I just wanna give you a reminder of uh, why we do what we do and, and why nicotine and tobacco is bad. So you have those talking points for the naysayers. So as you can see, one in five deaths in the US are due to smoking. And there's new data that examines nicotine's role as a gateway to the abuse of other substances and a potential trigger for serious mental illness in susceptible individuals. And hopefully that's a point that a lot of you probably already know and understand. And many forget, especially in, in the world we're in right now with COVID, um, that tobacco product use is the leading cause of preventable disease, disability, and death in the United States. So let's put some numbers to this information. Smoking and secondhand smoking kills more than half a million Americans annually. And when we say kill, we mean it takes 10 years off of a normal lifespan. So looking at the comparison of loss of life events that you see here on the screen, I'm, I'm sure you can probably think that your health department is probably not doing what they need to do uh, to address this issue of smoking. So we want to give you a little bit more understanding of the magnitude of these numbers. So again, half a million Americans annually die from smoking. So that would equate to at least three fully loaded 747 planes crashing and burning with everybody's life lost every single day. So let's imagine if this morning a plane crashed at JFK, then another one this afternoon, and then another one tonight. Planes would be grounded and most would stop flying. 
And I know that's a funny comparison given that we are in a pandemic and many are not traveling, but hopefully you get my point about the numbers. And when you're working against something like big tobacco, against a, a huge industry, you have to work with partners. So these are the, some partners that we work with because we find the best way to get effective policies passed is through coalitions. So I'm sure you recognize a lot of these organizations, American Cancer, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, American Lung, all organizations that we work with for the same cause of tobacco control. So we are also known as Tobacco 21, and I'm not gonna go into great detail about Tobacco 21, but just wanna give you some understanding of why we push to raise the age. 95% of current smokers started before the age of 21, and having a cigarette by the age 18 makes it twice as likely to become a lifelong smoker. So I wanna say that again, having a cigarette by the age 18 makes it twice as likely to become a lifelong smoker. And I'm sure you've all heard countless stories of kids or adults starting as early as 14 years old and easily buying cigarettes, claiming it was for their parents. And later on, Rob will go into more detail about the vulnerability of the brain during these formative years. One third, Americans, one third of American students have vaped in the past month. So if we were all in person, I would have us look to the right and to the left and decide which of the three of us has a high schooler that has vaped this past month. Raising the age from 18 to 21 helps remove access to under 18 social circles. So 18 year olds, 19 year olds, they're all in class, they're riding the bus with 14, 15, 16 and seven year old kids. So removing that access removes the chances of starting. So before we dive into our focus today of flavors and their role in health inequities, I just wanna set the stage of where we are from a legislative standpoint with minimum sales age laws. So our work in raising the age of tobacco sales started gaining some traction back in 2005. It slowed a little bit, but then some data came out from the results that happened in 2005 with the age being raised to 21. And it picked back up in 2013 with New York, New York City becoming the first major city to pass tobacco 21. Then in 2015, Hawaii became the first state to pass Tobacco 21 and so on. Then this past December, on December 20th, as part of the federal spending bill, President Trump signed into law the federal Tobacco 21 law, raising the legal sales age across the country from 18 to 21. So Tobacco 21 is law of the land. However, only 33 states have passed a statewide law and the remaining 17 need to update their antiquated laws to make sure they have parity with federal law and ensure proper and, inf proper and effective enforcement, which we'll talk about later. So I'm now going to shift it over to Dr. Crane, who's gonna talk more about nicotine and flavors. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. <clears throat> Hello, folks. Um, and we did just give a seminar in July, and many of you have already heard some of, these, uh, some of this information, but for those of you who may have not been with us, I wanted to fly through some of the basics about nicotine before we, before we start on flavors. Make sure I've got this working. Are you gonna advance here? There we go. Obviously the, the very simple molecule that's nicotine. It mimics uh, acetylcholine in the brain and uh, it stimulates uh, parts of the, of the brain that uh, it also stimulates in the grasshopper because it's in self, a, an insecticide. And that's the reason that the tobacco plant makes nicotine to kill off its predators. It has the exact same effect in our brains that it has in the grasshopper's brain. And that is to make dopamine. Now dopamine is the master neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, its uh, primary effect is very potent, dopamine release is deeply pleasurable. It reduces hunger, thirst, desire. It increases focus and it induces calm. Dopamine is the great neurohormone, but like any drug, overuse causes pretty serious problems. So where does dopamine work? Well, it works in the very deepest and most ancient parts of the brain, parts of the brain that we share with this guy from 60 million years ago. It uh, focuses on the mesolimbic system, the VTA and the nucleus accumbens. Uh, this is the reptilian part of the brain. This is where anger and lust live, fear and desire. This is an area that cannot be taken lightly. It's an area where 
you can actually dominate rational thought if this short circuiting of the brain occurs often enough. And of course, if you're smoking 10 to 20 cigarettes a day or vaping 30 times a day, that short circuiting becomes very powerful. Bottom line is if you mess with this area of an adolescent's brain, bad things are going to happen. And this is what we see with kids. Adolescent smokers are much higher risk for alcohol, marijuana, cocaine use, dropout rates are higher. Kids are more likely to vi have violent activities, get pregnant, to do all the things we would prefer kids not to do. Now we used to think this was simply a risk phenomenon, that kids who take do risk behaviors tend to, to do more substances, to have more problems down the line. But now there's increasing um, evidence that this early nicotine exposure is actually causative of some of these bad behaviors and difficult problems for kids. Deeply inhaled, high spikes of nicotine that occur with smoking or vaping actually changes the brain in a way that's semi-permanent or permanent. So as you look at this in terms of long-term effect, we've known for years that smoking is associated with a variety of other health and addiction problems, including mental health. 95% of alcoholic smoke, 95% <clears throat> of schizophrenics, the vast majority of those with bipolar disease, as well as drug addictions also smoke. And for years, psychiatrists with the support of the nicotine industry have told us, oh, they're just self-medicating. Well, they probably are the same way that an alcoholic calms his jitters with an eye opener in the morning, but it's not a useful strategy in the long run. In fact, the rapid ups and downs of smoking and inhaling nicotine makes the dop dopamine levels cycle up and down as well. It actually suppresses long-term dopamine levels in the brain in a way that clearly destabilizes affect and may initiate or worsen chronic mental illness and substance abuse. Some of you saw this slide this last summer. I want to remind you that, of course, addiction is a process. For opioid addiction, Frequently, kids and adults start with oral opioids, Percocets or Oxycontin. But as they ramp up their addiction and their brain adapts to these levels of, of opioids, they frequently move to the stronger stuff. Heroin gives you a much faster, stronger high, and once you've gotten there, it's hard to go back the other direction. Well, if you think about Juul or puff bars or any of the more popular e-cigarettes, they become training wheels for combustible cigarette smoking. Marlboros on the right are much more like heroin. They deliver nicotine much faster than e-cigarettes. Juul delivers a lot of nicotine, certainly at addictive levels, but more slowly allowing kids to accommodate to the difficult uh, uh, addiction that is nicotine. Now I want you to take a look first at the blue line. This is cigarette use in 12th graders. They are by far and away the best predictors of adult use. Notice there's a steady drop over the last 20 years, quite even predictable drop. This is because of higher taxes, better education, strong counter marketing, smoke-free schools, and of course, smoke-free businesses. Now look at this really astonishing and worrisome line for e-cigarettes. In five years, we have basically completely reversed two decades of progress. If you also look closely, you can see that the blue line pivots just slightly at about 2015. If we were on the same straight line down with the slope as it was from 1999 to 2015, we would predict to be at 4% levels of 12th grade smoking. But indeed, the e-cigarette to cigarette conversion in kids has changed that slope. So what causes e-cigarette use? This is a slide stolen directly from Brian King, Dr. King of the CDC. I show it because it clearly illustrates what happens with kids. <clears throat> Great advertising, social media brings kids in flavors entice kids, and then nicotine holds them. You've all seen these advertisements before. 
sex, celebrities, candy. They are a marketing dream. And they have, of course, have snagged a bunch of kids. Even more importantly had been the online social media campaign, which was brilliantly conducted by Jewel and this, uh, continues to uh, affect the kids nationally. <clears throat> but there's also another part of this, <clears throat> and that is product design. Uh, the funny thing about product design is that it's illegal. The 2009 Family Smoking Prevention Act had several tenets. One of the most important one was that no new products were allowed to be introduced without explicit FDA approval. So why do we have all these new products? Five generations of e-cigarettes. Well, the FDA decided that they were going to allow e-cigarettes to develop as a possible alternative to combustible cigarettes. Their reasoning was that Combustibles are so bad that these cigarettes must be better, right? Well, that, of course, turned out not necessarily to be the case. The other thing, of course, they allowed, which was really destructive, was they allowed the e-cigarette makers to change the chemical composition of nicotine. Nicotine in a cigarette occurs as a free base, absorbed very quickly, which makes Marlboro so potent and so heroin-like but didn't sit well with kids who would get sick. Uh, they didn't like the harsh flavor on the back of their throat, that throat hit as it were. And uh, the e-cigarette industry quickly switched to a benzoate salt of nicotine, which makes the pH lower and allows more slow absorption, making kids more easily uh, available, making kids uh, who could more easily adapt to this form of nicotine. Again, an illegal phenomenon that the FDA tolerated. You can see, of course, that the FDA has also just recently allowed, in fact, they have made FDA approval for ICOS, which is Philip Morris's heat not burn technology. The reason I put this slide up is to remind you, of course, that they're using the same old sexy models to make this uh, brand come forward, not to 60-year-old people who are trying to quit, but to 16-year-olds who are going to get started. For those of us in tobacco control and public health folks and regulators and legislators, this is a constant problem of whack-a-mole. Just as soon as we regulate or legislate or try to control one issue in, in uh, one product, another one steps up and changes uh, the legislative agenda and we're whacking them all again, we've got to find ways that draw a clear line that cannot be crossed by the industry. So let's talk about flavors. That's why we're here today. Flavors are the major issue to think about. Flavors, of course, are not just one, but about 8,000 different flavors of e-cigarettes. Someone tells you they know that e-cigarettes are safer than combustible cigarettes, and regular cigarettes. You might ask them, which e-cigarette are you talking about? These 8,000 flavors have never been tested in the lungs. Many of them are used as flavors in food that you ingest through your mouth. And that's not the same as heating it up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit and taking it into the most delicate parts of your lungs. We have no idea what's going to happen over the next 30 years, which is how long it took us to figure out that combustible cigarettes were bad. We could already see that e-cigarettes and the flavors that they bring with them cause lung disease, cause heart disease. We haven't seen cancer yet, but who knows what's going to happen down the line. Buffar is, I think, a perfect example of the whack-a-mole phenomenon. When the FDA cracked down on flavors in the pod-based systems, the Juul systems, they didn't allow anything but menthol and tobacco flavors in the pod systems. Within weeks, up sprang Puff Bar and those like it. Because there was a loophole, the FDA said pod-based systems cannot have anything but menthol and tobacco, but disposables like Puff Bar and the tank-based systems that are found in vape shops, well, they can have whatever flavors they want. And of course, when you create a loophole, 
they drive a truckload of kids through it. I want to focus a little bit on what flavors kids use. And this is just from six months ago, 2020 uh, spring. Uh, and I want to look specifically at the pod-based systems and the disposables. And you can see that kids gravitate to fruit, to mint, to candy, desserts, and sweets, and of course, to menthol itself. Uh, this is one of the problems that we face that every time you try to change things, uh, this, the system is based on accommodating industry, and that has meant a huge number of kids, tens of millions addicting because of flavors. Well, didn't the FDA ban flavors? Well, like I said, they did ban flavors in, on the left-hand side there in pod-based systems. And that was only tobacco flavors and menthol that were allowed, but all these other systems, including the disposables, are still allowed through this FDA loophole, the loopholes they keep creating to accommodate the desires of the powerful lobbyists of the industry. So what's happened? Well, just like Tobacco 21 sprang up across localities in the United States, a logical move to get tobacco out of the, house, <clears throat> out of the high school Many communities, 290 plus localities, have passed some sort of flavor ban restriction. Now, most of those are just on e-cigarettes, but increasingly, and we're gonna talk about menthol as the most dangerous flavor we have, uh, two states and many localities have banned menthol in regular cigarettes, as well as all flavors in e-cigarettes. Now, this is interesting. We already had a ban on cigarette flavors other than menthol, but it's got a loophole. And that loophole is the characterizing loophole. When the 2009 law was passed, it said, look, you can't have any flavors in regular cigarettes other than menthol that are characterizing. That is to say, you can't have a chocolate cigarette that tastes like chocolate and advertises a chocolate cigarette. But you can have flavors as long as they are not specifically named and have a characterizing scent or flavor. It can't smell like chocolate. It can't smell like licorice. It can't smell like mint or uh, fruit, but it can have an ingredient that is like that. And states and localities cannot regulate because of this preemption in 2009 any kind of ingredient uh, characterization. So this is what they have to read. I'm not gonna read that to you, but it simply says that if you're a state or a locality, you cannot regulate ingredients and therefore flavors stay. Well, how many flavors stay? Well, this is from Philip Morris. As you can see, there are 22 flavors that Philip Morris lists in their cigarettes that are not allowed to have flavors. 22 flavors, not 22, I'm sorry, it's 44 flavors. I'm sorry, that's, that's not even correct. No, no, it's 66 flavors on the Philip Morris website. No, 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 I'm wrong. It's 88 flavors. No, 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 I'm still at 108 flavors that Philip Morris Altria this is just in its products that are cigarette based. The cigarette flavors, which are not supposed to be allowed, except for this characterizing loophole. What you can see, of course, is that sugars predominate because a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, in this case, nicotine. And it changes, of course, the ability of people to taste the bitter, peppery taste of nicotine. And that's especially true for young throats. This is a loophole that has to be closed. Now, while Mr. McConnell was running the Senate, that was never going to happen. But maybe come November, there may be new legislators, new folks in the administration. If that happens, we have to address the 2009 law, which kept local and state governments from actually regulating ingredients We've got to get flavors, all flavors, out of all products. Now, let's talk about uh, 
the loophole thing, of course, is, is something we have to address, but I want to talk briefly about the other side of this picture. All the e-cigarette folks will tell you they're just in this to help the adult smoker who wants to quit move to a less harmful type of nicotine ingestion. And so, interestingly, in this last two weeks, two major studies have come out based on this long-term assessment for tobacco and health called PATH. 50,000 people are interviewed every year starting in 2013 with deep, uh, um, in-depth interviews that uh, allow us to look at why they choose to smoke or not smoke and what influences them. Well, an assessment of these two uh, studies over the last uh, several years have been recently released and uh, published. One by Pierce with about 30 different investigators looks at about 2,700 smokers who are trying to quit. A quarter of them used e-cigarettes. Now, two thirds of them used nothing. And a small percentage used nicotine replacement, or bupropion or Chantix, but the overwhelming majority of people quit on their own. Chen, the same thing, about 2,500, and they found about 17% used e-cigarettes. And the purpose of the study was to see if people who used e-cigarettes had a better chance of quitting. Obviously, they would give credence to the idea that e-cigarette users, uh, the e-cigarettes are a valuable part of our toolkit in trying to get people off combustible cigarettes. Well, that wasn't the case. What both of these studies showed was that about 13% of people were able to quit and it didn't matter whether they were using e-cigarettes or nothing at all. The difference, of course, being that those who used e-cigarettes, between a half and a third of them remained addicted to nicotine. And nicotine, as we talked about before, is not benign. Now I'm going to change this over to, uh, so the bottom line for me, that on a population basis, e-cigarettes do not provide harm reduction. And in fact, they may cause harm. Now I'm going to turn it over to Amanda again. You can take control. She's going to talk about menthol, which is the worst and most deadly um, flavor that we have. Thanks, Amanda. Yep. Thank you, Rob. Um, so... As you've seen, flavors are an issue and menthol um, should definitely be included in flavor bands. And I wanna give you a bit of history about menthol so you can understand um, why it continues to be exempted in these flavor bands. So menthol cigarettes are often marketed as easier and safer cigarettes for first time smokers. And that sounds familiar because Rob just talked about how that is, that is what they do with these nicotine salts and all these various flavors for e-cigarettes. This is not new. This method is not, not new at all. So advertisements claim that menthol causes less irritation to the throat and a cooling effect with which lessens the harshness of tobacco. And that is true. So that makes menthol easier to become addicted to and harder to quit. So over the next couple of slides, as we go through the history of menthol, you're gonna start seeing some obvious trends, but right now let's review some facts. One in seven black adults in the US smoke cigarettes. Over 85% of black smokers prefer menthol. Seven out of 10 black teens smoke menthol. Menthol products are given more shelf space in minority neighborhoods. And as we've already said, they are marketed as easier and safer. Again, sounds familiar, right? With our vaping, our vaping tools that are out there. And tobacco retailers cluster in neighborhoods of color. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go through some history here. In 2009, after the passage of the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, that is when Congress got rid of all flavored uh, cigarettes, not vaping, because vaping, we were not in the vaping epidemic yet, but flavored cigarettes, except menthol, they, created the Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee, which was created to study the impact of menthol. So this was a three-year study. And in 2011, this advisory committee came out saying, finding that menthol was bad and removal of menthol would benefit public health. Well, as you can probably guess, 
the industry, Big Tobacco, was not happy about that. And they actually sued, saying that the study was biased. Thankfully, in 2013, the court struck down this suit and said it was not biased. Then the FDA did their own review of menthol, and they found that it increased smoking initiation by youth, it caused greater nicotine addiction, it lessened the likelihood of, to quit, and was marketed as a smoother alternative. So they also concluded that menthol caused substantial greater health risk. They posted this study and they put out a call for public comment and nothing happened. Even with the conclusion that menthol is bad, nothing happened. And then in 2018, they did another call for public comment and nothing happened. In 2019, the FDA banned all flavored tobacco products. So these are our, our vaping products. And you heard about all the other loopholes um, and they excluded menthol from that ban, even with their findings. So this might be obvious, but I just wanna review what is menthol. Menthol is the chemical found in the mint plant that makes mint flavor. So in fact, there is more menthol in menthol flavoring than in mint flavor. And reminder, mint, just mint flavor was banned, not menthol. And as you can see here, menthol is the top user, is used by mostly kids and youth and young adults. And 80% of black, more than 80% of black smokers use menthol. And although we have seen a decline in the usage of smoking regular cigarettes, we have not seen the same with menthol cigarettes. So again, I hope you're seeing a trend here. And let's go a little deeper into the history of menthol. So flavors are not new. This is not new uh, to the tobacco industry. In 2000, excuse me, in 1925, the first mentholated cigarette called Spud was introduced. And in the 50s, big tobacco started engaging groups like the Urban League, the NAACP, the United Negro College Fund by supporting their cultural events and scholarship programs. They even used civil rights movement messaging to help sell their products. And then Cool, which is a menthol product, started doing their campaigns that featured jazz artists, and then it evolved into using images of rappers, DJs, dancers on their advertisements, and they even create these free fun events and even went around inner city Houston at one point distributing free menthol cigarettes. In 1998, Ebony Magazine was ten, almost 10 times more likely than People Magazine to contain ad for menthol. And then in 2009, we've already talked about this, that's when the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, when all flavors, cigarette, flavored cigarettes were banned except menthol. So then you start seeing an uptick in Altria, which is the parent company of Philip Morris, donating to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, donating to uh, black legislators and to candidates. And uh, so again, hopefully you're seeing this trend here. And this all upticked when Congress considered banning menthol flavors. And even in 2014, Altria donated a million dollars to Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And then 2019, the FDA had the opportunity to do some, some big action to ban all flavors, but they still excluded menthol. And to be fair, a lot of the legislators that were receiving donations from Altria and other big tobacco companies, a lot of them represent regions that have tobacco farms, but that should not prevent them from supporting policies that improve public health. And beyond this timeline of egregious behavior, it's clear that big tobacco executives had full intention of targeting kids and minorities. And here are some quotes that have been put out there. We don't smoke it, we just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. Cherry skull is for somebody who likes the taste of candy, if you know what I'm saying. So as you glance at these quotes, this was all deliberate, this was all intentional to put menthol in front of kids and in front of minority communities. In fact, there are up to 10 times more tobacco ads in black neighborhoods than other neighborhoods. This is blatant targeting. And in, in addition to the cool campaign through music and the saturation of ads in black communities and publications, big tobacco took advantage of the fact that often black communities were not typically portrayed positively in the media. They use images to portray them as happy, confident, successful, wealthy, in love, attractive, strong, 
independent. And you'll notice a lot of these ads are similar to what we saw with the vaping ads that Rob showed you earlier. So recently, fortunately, however, many progressive legislators have kept public health and their community safety as a priority over big tobacco's financial support. And in fact, moving my slide, there we go. In fact, the late Representative John Lewis spoke out against tobacco and flavored cigarettes, including menthol. And in the last couple of years, many major African-American civic and health and medical organizations, such as the National African-American Tobacco Prevention Network, the NAACP, the National Urban League, the National Medical Association, and the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council have spoken out against big tobacco. Most recently, the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council sued the FDA for not taking action on their conclusion that it would benefit public health to add menthol to the list of prohibited characterizing flavors, therefore banning it from sales. And many of these, these organizations have challenged Big Tobacco for not conducting their business that support Black Lives. So I'm gonna switch over, we're gonna go, I wanna show you a video that's really compelling that came out from the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids that supported the most recent flavor ban legislation in California. I held your body until it was lifeless with no heartbeat and it is messing with me. The machine's beep beep sound is giving me a headache and I don't know how because I remember hearing that beep beep sound until there was no more beep beep pound and the nurses came in and turned off the machines like it was just another round as your body laid there you were nowhere to be found. Menthol cigarettes put my mother in the ground lawmaker save another child from having to hear this sound. Black lives matter hands up don't shoot what does a black life really mean to you? How many more black lives is the price that we have to pay? So you want to ban all flavors except for the ones that take black lives away and not understand that Menthol is a candy flavor too. As a kid, I love gummy bears, three musketeers, oh, and junior mints too. How do I explain to my child that their life means nothing to you? Because if it did, their future would have the same protection as the kids in the suburbs do. Vaping does damage like cigarettes do, but banning only flavors that blacks don't use seems to be important to you. Senate Bill 793 will ban all flavored tobacco, including menthols, 123 lives a day. How many more black lives have to die before lawmakers say enough is enough? Thank you. So, pretty powerful. But banning only flavors that Blacks don't use seems to be important to you. And we will share these videos after the presentation. So as we review, to do an adequate flavor ban that includes menthol does not only help prevent kids from becoming addicted to nicotine, but it is imperative to the Black Lives Matter movement so that we can call out Big Tobacco's history of contributing to systematic racism. And just as important as raising the sales age and banning flavors, to make these legislative initiatives successful, we have to have effective enforcement. So it really doesn't matter if the sales age is 21 or 51. If it is not enforced, it will not be effective. This goes, this is holds true for flavors. There is no regulation or enforcement, it doesn't matter. And this is an area that our organization has been focused on for the last couple of years, actually since the beginning of our Tobacco 21 initiatives. One of the tools that I wanna share with you that helps in uh, partnering with flavor bans or density, uh, density rules with tobacco is the tobacco retail license. This is a critical legislative method that gives teeth to sales age and flavor bans as well as policies to regulate tobacco sales saturation in neighborhoods of color and distance to school. So what a tobacco retail license does, and, and what we're talking about here, every business has various licenses. So this is just another line item to run a business that can range from 200 to $500 per year. And what it does is establishes a comprehensive list of all nicotine and tobacco retailers. It funds enforcement of sales regulation at no cost to the taxpayer. It provides weight to current sales law by imposing a threat of suspension for repeat violations. So a typical retail store makes about half a million dollars a year just in the sale of tobacco. So imagine if they were threatened to lose their license, they probably would start imposing laws around legal sales age. They probably would train their, their clerks to make sure they did not do illegal sales because if they had the threat to lose their license to have it suspended or revoked, 
they are going to follow the law. This is a proven fact. It's not putting the penalty on the purchaser who's already addicted. It's making sure that they are not selling it to these underage kids who are addicted. Plus it advanced public health through prevention and substantially increases health equity. So in a lot of states, you have to have a license for fishing, being a hairdresser, giving tattoos, selling alcohol, hunting, owning a dog, and you definitely have to have a license to sell marijuana if it's legal in your state. But there are some states that you don't have to have a license to sell tobacco. And some of you, hopefully most of you are shaking your head and confused. Why don't you have to have a license to sell tobacco that could be cigarettes or e-cigarettes? And that is what we're working towards. And if you want to go into more detail about tobacco retail licensing, we actually have a tool on our website that goes into detail of tobacco retail licensing. So now I'm going to show you where does your state stand with tobacco retail licensing. So the orange means that your state does not have a tobacco retail license at all, and yellow means that it's not adequate. And I will argue that some of the ones that say it's comprehensive or has a multiple license that cover all products, some of these do need to be refreshed or need to be strengthened a little bit. Maybe their licensing fee isn't as adequate. So we are examining this across the country. But Arizona, um, you do not have to have a tobacco retail licensing. Florida, um, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, you can have, you have a tobacco retail license for cigarettes, but not e-cigarettes. Kansas, Missouri, New Jersey, same. They have tobacco retail licensing, but it does not include e-cigarettes. So when you are going around to make sure that retailers are not selling e-cigarettes to underage kids, there is no comprehensive list for them to check on. Some of these states say that they just drive, the attorney general's office or the health department just drives around, makes random checks. There's no systematic way to make these checks. Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Nevada, you do not, they do not have a tobacco retail license. And then lastly, Oregon, South Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Wyoming do not have a tobacco retail license program. So shifting from enforcement, I do want to remind us all that we are in the midst of a respiratory disease pandemic. So a couple of reminders about what COVID-19 does and what the dangers of smoking and vaping are connected to COVID-19. So when you inhale nicotine, it weakens the protective lining of the lungs and paralyzes the tiny hair cells that sweep the lung clear foreign particles. And smokers already have a widespread lung inflammation and microscarring that can exacerbate the pneumonia firestorm caused by COVID-19. And those who smoke are more likely to experience more severe cases of COVID-19. And recently, a study came out from Stanford that said teen vapors are up to seven times more likely to get COVID-19 than non-e-cigarette users. We'll make sure we send out the article around this study so you can share this in your various social media and communication platforms so that your students and the people around you that support your students understand teen vapors. Vapors are seven times more likely to get COVID-19. For so long, everybody said that young people were immune to this, that they were not getting it, and then we saw an uptick, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that a lot of them are vapors. So, Surpri not surprisingly, big tobacco has taken advantage of the pandemic. And we have a video that's funny, but we say it's funny, but it's true. So it's not terribly funny because it's, there's a lot of truth to it around how, how big tobacco is using the pandemic to push and sell their products. Normally the world is pulling itself apart. However, this pandemic has us all helping each other out in surprising ways. I clap so hard for essential workers, my palms have started peeling. Or maybe that's from washing my hands 500 times a day. Even big tobacco is in the helping spirit. Actually, come here, come here. If I keep it 100 with you, what they're actually doing is cashing in on a pandemic, all while sending mixed messages to the public, ensuring they stay on their target of selling products which kill over 8 million people every year. I don't want you to get so caught up in the helping people that you lose sight of your bottom line. Let me be your new marketing consultant. I can give you some tips that guarantee that you'll be balling during COVID. Come on, step into my office. So right now, some vape shops are giving away free masks with purchase and offering pandemic perks like doorstep delivery. But I don't think that's good enough. 
If these shops are already selling your products, why not collab with them and give them free masks with vape pens already built in? Look at what my cousin Vivi drew up. That thing's slick, isn't it? This is the prototype. See, the COVID, the COVID know not to go inside here. This is just for the vape. We still working out the kinks. Now, let's talk about the free ventilators you're sending in hospitals. Not only do they make the dude who sends flowers look cheap, you're also keeping people alive, which is genius. People can't vape if they're dead, but I have an idea that's even more genius. It's like the Vape Mask 5.0, but it's even better. I present to you the Vapolator, the newest and high-tech technology that pumps people full of oxygen and mango-flavored vape juice at the same time. Now you can beat COVID and get addicted to nicotine together. And by the way, don't you steal this idea. This is patent pending. Wait, that's not where that cord goes. Next, let's discuss your PR strategy. I know you funded researchers who claim that nicotine prevents COVID. Not bad, I give it a six out of 10 for creativity, but in this era of alternative facts, you gotta put that thing on turbo, baby. Let's see what else we can just claim that nicotine does. What, what if we just said, nicotine makes your toes unstoppable, or it cures baby baldness, or it helps save polar bears. How about this, how about this? Nicotine makes dog doo-doo taste like ice cream. You know somebody's gonna try it. Look, Big Tobacco, when the checks start rolling in, you better make sure I get my cut, man. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go figure out how to sleep at night. How do you guys do it? I'm gonna go this way. Yeah. So much to pull from that video, and I think my favorite is, people can't vape if they did. <laughs> so. We will share these videos with everybody afterwards so that you can use them and put them in your various social platforms. So what can you do? Well, you can call your local and state representatives, especially if you saw your name on the, if saw your state on the list of not having a TRL or not having adequate tobacco retail licensing and ask them, why are they not regulating the sales of a deadly product? And if your state hasn't passed Tobacco 21, which you can go to our website, it's on the home screen just at tobacco21.org. You can call your representatives and ask them, why aren't they protecting kids, especially during a respiratory pandemic? And obviously you can warn your students about the dangers of vaping. There are studies out there now that you can share with them that especially now, now is the time to quit. There's no better time to quit. We have this fact sheet that has all this spelled out that we'll send to you afterwards as well that you can post, you can send around. And also tell your students that, that they support Black Lives Matters, they should be quitting Big Tobacco because Big Tobacco is not supportive of the Black community and they're definitely not supportive of the health of the Black community. These kids are probably protesting, so encourage them, you know, protest Big Tobacco if this is a cause that matters to them. And then obviously encourage your universities to be smoke free. And if you have students that are addicted, we are a fan of the Truth Initiative. They're the ones that create that last video that you send and they can go to a program called This Is Quitting. So with that, I'm gonna pause and we're gonna take some questions or if Rob wants to add anything else before we go to the questions, we will switch to the question portion of the afternoon. No, that's great. Thank you, Amanda. Really good stuff. <clears throat> you get to see what we actually look like. <laughs> Hear my dog barking in the background. Well, thank you so much. As they shared, this is our time for questions. So please submit your questions via the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we did have one question that came in a little bit earlier. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started with that. So it was when you were talking about different mental health issues and their likeliness to be smoking and using tobacco and nicotine products. Why do, why do so many people who have mental illnesses uh, use tobacco and nicotine products? That is a really excellent question that we've all been trying to address. So I think it was a calculation not too long ago that people with serious mental illness smoke 40% of all the cigarettes smoked in the United States. That's because they use so heavily there have been many theories about this, and the one proposed by the, the nicotine industry and tobacco is that they're self-medicating. They have variable dopamine levels because of their mental illness. Their affect is already in, on the rocks, and they can boost their dopamine up and make themselves feel a little better if they uh, smoke a cigarette. 
Uh, the challenge, of course, is that that's not the case. Uh, most people started smoking before they became alcoholic. They started smoking before they became schizophrenic. And so we know that smoking contributes in some susceptible individuals to mental illness and other substance abuse. And even after the fact, because smoking is a spike of dopamine followed by a collapse of dopamine, spike, collapse, spike, collapse, and finally a lowered total level of dopamine in the brain as the brain ramps down its sensitivity to dopamine, these folks actually get worse. If you look at rehab centers where smoking is allowed versus rehab centers where smoking is not allowed, those who address both issues of addiction do much better than those who allow smoking uh, to continue. But a great question. Thank you, Dr. Crane. We have another question that came in. Um, I have many st students who want to quit vaping but just don't know how. Are, are there many any resources you recommend for students trying to quit? Can tobacco sensation programs work for baking, uh, vaping sensation as well? Amanda, why don't you take that with your slide there? Sure. So the last slide we show is around the Truth Initiative, which is a program called This Is Quitting. So if you go, you can have them text Ditch Jewel, Ditch Jewel, and there's two U's in Jewel, to 88709. And I'll put that in the comments. See, oh, there's the slide. You could take a screenshot of that slide, and I could also put that information in the um, comments. I will tell you, though, that uh, having worked on cessation issues for the last uh, 15 years uh, in Ohio, there's no good data showing that anything works very well for adolescents trying to quit, whether it's vaping or cigarettes. This is one of the toughest nuts to crack. Uh, pregnant women and adolescent smokers really uh, don't respond to almost any of the traditional quitting mechanisms. I hope the dish jewel works. It's worth a try. But I think the most important message here is to prevent early addiction, not to try to treat it. And the biggest, the biggest way to quit is to be motivated to quit. Um, we've heard the, one of the biggest issues of trying to quit Juul is because of the social circles, because uh, it's, it surrounds them, it's all around them. So, you know, their motivation, and right now we say there's no better time to quit because we're in the respiratory pandemic. So I think if you can maybe scare them and explain to them the stats around the likelihood of them getting COVID if they are vapors, maybe that'll help with their motivation. Actually, frightening doesn't work that well with teenagers because they're invulnerable and that's true. And they're that's forever. Yeah. What they're you have to tell them is they've been had. And uh, uh, I think if you've seen the some of the ads for um, cigarettes uh, cessation that feature a teenager walking up trying to buy a pack of cigarettes, and the and the retailer says that's not enough, and they make them pull out a, a tooth or something like that. That's uh, that part of being had um, and being controlled by somebody else is not uh, something teenagers like. Thank you so much. I know the presentation today was primarily focused on e-use of nicotine products, but do you all present on smokeless forms of nicotine products as well? So we do uh, attend to that. It's not as big a problem uh, in terms of long-term morbidity and mortality, but clearly oral health and uh, cancers of the mouth and throat uh, are precipitated by uh, folks who've been using spit tobacco all their lives, whether it's a red man or something else, uh, and especially tough for uh, athletes uh, who got into this habit because their favorite stars were chewing tobacco on the Atlanta Braves or whatever. Uh, we focus on that, but right now the vaping epidemic is so manifest with, uh, you know, 40% of uh, high school seniors uh, vaping, it's uh, kind of overshadowed everything else. So I know you touched on this uh, a little bit in your presentation, uh, but could you elaborate further as to why do African-Americans smoke more menthol than whites? Just elaborate on that a little bit further, I guess. They were, they were targeted, you know, 10 times more likely in their neighborhoods to have a tobacco advertisement. Um, just even in their publication, we put out that in 1998, there was 10 times more likely to have an ad around menthol in Ebony Magazine than in People Magazine. So it was, it was a complete targeting market target marketing effort by Big Tobacco to go towards the African-American communities with menthol. I would also suggest that there may be some 
physiologic, that is taste-based phenomenon with African-Americans that they may have different uh, sensitivities. Uh, there's certainly cultural issues. African-American kids do not addict nearly as early as Caucasian and Asian kids. Uh, I don't think we know why that is, maybe uh, a phenomenon of, of uh, economic accessibility, but African-American kids addict much later and they are much more sensitive to the harsh taste uh, and bitter peppery taste of nicotine. We think that's why menthol plays a role and then of course that's exacerbated tremendously by the enormous marketing power of the industry. Have you seen a decline in vaping due to COVID and schools going remote for so many months? Actually, we are seeing a decline. So I, I was showing you the graph from 2019 because that's the last data we have for seniors in high school. But if you're looking at the overall use of high school uh, of uh, vape products in high school, we've seen about a 25% decline just in the last year. And I think that has to do with the vaping-induced lung disease, which scared a lot of people and got parents interested. Some reduction in flavors. And I think, of course, that the fact that their kids are not in their social circles has actually helped the uh, uh, use of uh, epidemic uh, vaping. And also the passage of Tobacco 21 has been yeah, helpful. Yeah, of course, right. Reducing access. It looks like we have just one more question. Um, do you have any recommend, re recommendation or know what works for engaging African-American students to get involved in working towards a nicotine-free campus or school? I think sharing with them the egregious behavior by big tobacco. You know, why support an industry that's not supporting their community? You know, talk to them through that lens and that might activate them to, to as another form of protest. Right, if you think about uh, number of deaths, um, uh, horrible deaths from police shootings, but um, menthol kills 20 times as many African-Americans. Well, those are all the questions that we have. I'm just gonna share some final housekeeping slides. Thank you so much, Dr. Crane and Amanda for another very informative and much needed session. So thank you so much. And I look forward to being able to share those resources that you provided during this session. I just a friendly reminder that our second session in the biennial review learning collaborative uh, inventory and assessment of programs will be happening on October 8th. You are still able to purchase access to the learning collaborative. Uh, this is like a hybrid set up between a blend of like asynchronous and synchronous courses. Uh, if you miss the first session, that's no problem. You, you'll still have access to all of those materials. You can learn more by visiting our website at hecaod.osu.edu. And with that, I thank you so much for everybody that was able to tune in for today's live session. You can expect to see this session's recorded along with the resources uploaded to our website within about three, three to four business days. So thank you everybody and take care. <laughs>